what up guys uh welcome back i think it's the first video post arnold yes it is trevor has confirmed since i don't know what day it is we need a grown up here to confirm is it tuesday <laughs> tuesday my kids are on spring break too so i have no uh, idea yeah. what's going on no idea what day it is <laughs> um but this is the first one post arnold um as promised brought home some hardware yeah the back yes but it's it's somewhere yeah but it's, it's somewhere maybe it's still in ohio damn it uh <laughs> But um, so anyway, hopefully y'all watch that. If you didn't, I'll have Trevor put some clips in here of Terrence uh, flexing some muscles and looking spectacular and uh, kick some ass. And it was a great show, fun show. Everybody else looked really good too. Yeah, yeah. Um, everyone's awesome. You know, all the competitors, yeah, we got along backstage, which is really, really cool. I mean, uh, you know, when it first started, it wasn't quite, no one was ever mean, but I think now, like, you know, it's been six years and a lot of the guys are starting to build like relationships and friendships and it's, it's cool. Yeah, it was awesome. And from a fan standpoint too, so just watching the show, I thought about doing this, but it would have been too much work and I don't want anybody to think about what I was, well, there's nothing implying to be what I was saying, but like the top five particularly, I mean, top six, honestly, um, all the guys looked awesome. And the biggest thing I always like too, because obviously like, you know, bodybuilding is genetics as well too. So some people can't help their shape, their structure but you can always help being in shape. And every single guy in the top six was just shredded inside out, conditioning spot on. Whereas if you look at the open, it's, I mean, for me, it's not, I don't know, like there's some guys that get shredded inside out, but the consistency, so I'm not trying to necessarily say something <laughs> negative about the open, but more, I didn't say a word. <laughs> but more give a compliment to the classic guys. And I honestly think people like that. And, you know, so some of the classic is obviously people like that look more so than the modern era of bodybuilding, but I like it as well too. Because again, sometimes in the open, you're just looking and, you know, maybe half the guys aren't in great shape. And I'm just like, you're professional bodybuilders at the Arnold. Like, come on, man, like get in shape. And um, and again, so there were some guys that were in great shape, obviously, the Arnold. Like, it was great to see William looked awesome. I yeah, thought Justin looked Justin awesome. A lot of guys, crazy. Brandon always yeah. looks good. I mean, so I'm not implying, you know, the top four, top five in the Arnold were in very good shape as well, too. But uh, if you really compared the classes, man, those uh, classic guys were just inside out. And, uh, and it was awesome. Yeah, I mean, uh, like you said, you can basically tell you know, in classes, like all the guys get along, like that's cool on stage as well too. And getting some cool pics and the pose yeah, down and all that yeah. shit, it was, it was awesome. I really enjoyed watching it from both sides of the deal. Um, all right, that's enough of that. Um, <laughs> good job, pat on the back. Yes. Now on to the next one. I get one a year. Yes, exactly. <laughs> one pat on the back Maybe a year. two this year. Maybe yeah, two. Two this year, that's Maybe. the big goal. <laughs> Um, but so for today, I, and so honestly, like I wanted to, um, I kind of mentioned to Terrence a little bit about um, from my understanding, obviously we talked a little bit, we both really liked this last split. Um, it seemed to really do the job well for, cause it's always like, again, I want to, the whole reason I want to have this conversation without having Terrence and I talked much beforehand is cause I want you guys to again, get like a realistic feel of how things at work, at least from my end, right. Where again, I hate in the industry. Sometimes there's this notion of like gatekeeping where there's like this whole, you know, you have these super smart educators and trainers and like they got, you know, this board where they're putting, you know, equations together and here's the perfect program and, you know, here's all your phases and here's all the blah, 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 blah. And again, I'm not knocking having a plan. And as long as a coach can deliver results, there's no wrong way to go about it. Um, but most of the time, whenever we're putting a split together or something, I mean, I want as much of Terrence's input, you know, as my input as well, too, because at this point in time, obviously he gets it. He gets training in general. Obviously, he understands his physique. Um, we still know that basically, I, this might be one of the first times I wouldn't say we're really, you know, working on the same stuff where I think he's completely pretty much balanced top to bottom. Um, so we really can just basically try and get everything bigger. Uh, the only thing I would still say is like, you know, because of how big Terrence's torso muscles, his legs are like, his arms are never going to be too big. So we can still just kind of chase those freaky arms. I mean, again, the judges even said everything's balanced now. We can even train the lower body a little bit harder. Um, so now really you're just trying to get to the realm where can we actually make his arms be like, oh shit, like kind yeah. of more of like a standout body part, like every other body part. Um, so as far as overall goals, that's that's probably the only difference this time is, and I don't think it's, uh, Terrence, we are talking about this, we're not going to add in any extra days or anything for legs. Basically, we're going to be able to train legs a little bit harder because honestly, over the last year or so, volume has just been yeah. kept really low, you know, we'll do, we do hard sets. So there might be a hard set here, you know, four hard sets for hamstrings, whatever it is, but they're not quite like they used to be. And so now we're going to progress a little bit more back towards how they used to be, which will be entertaining for you guys as well too. Um, but so all I want to talk with Terrence today is just, um, just for time's sake, we're doing a push day today. Um, so just kind of go through movements today. I had a couple of ideas that I wanted to tweak for today. 
Um, but aside from that, uh, mainly just Terrence's feedback. And I always go over this as well, too, because one of the first things we're going to talk about is our main chest movement. And I tell people all the time, it is kind of for semantic reasons that a lot of different movements work for chest press movements. It's not one of those things where, you know, on paper I could say, what's the perfect pull down? And if I'm really <clears> writing what's perfect, you know, you need to have something with a pretty good profile, it needs to line up right. You don't have like 20 exercises to choose from. Whereas for chest, um, really it's all kind of splitting hairs. I could probably write 20 different movements, honestly, that will all be relatively as effective. So from again, this is where it's big, where depending on how they're feeling for Terrence, do we just keep the one we've been doing? Do we rotate to something else? Whatever. So um, basically just kind of going through our push day today. I actually don't want, really want to change anything. Um, the only thing that I wanted to change is uh, the order actually, where I think actually the thing I'll flip flop is once we go from high incline machine press or whatever we choose to keep there or rotate there is go right to triceps then and then actually finish with delts after that. Yeah, I think my delts were pretty, pretty sick. Yeah. <laughs> the low, even though we're doing like super low volume for delts, I still think they're pretty, yeah, pretty big. Yeah, yeah, yeah. which I honestly, it's like half of it, we didn't prioritize them at all. And um, they're still huge, which honestly, I think is good because we, the judges, I remember at one point in time, were like, you need to get your back wider. And I'm just thinking like, I don't even think they know exactly what they're saying. Yeah. But like, if we're gonna get them wider, just keep getting the delts bigger as well too. So we'll take any growth there, but just to basically prioritize triceps a little bit above them, just a real easy flip-flop to order there. So my only thoughts ahead of time were flip-flop that, um, maybe rotate that tricep movement, or we can keep that one, um, kind of up to you on that. I was probably gonna take dips out just to keep volume a little bit lower at the start. And then maybe after we kind of blast or whatever we go here, maybe add a compound movement towards the end, but maybe just see how it goes without that. Um, but so going through what we did have, I guess that was a question. The first one we've been doing, obviously, incline cement. Keep it, rotate it. Thoughts? Um, <clears throat> I like it. I figured if we if we do change it, then uh, maybe just the prime prime piece we have, the okay. incline prime. If you want to, some of our, might be nice for a change, I guess. Okay. Yeah, sweet. Well, maybe we'll rotate that. So there you go. We've been starting with incline cement. Um, and honestly, we do have a badass. That prime piece is really nice as well, it's been, too. It's been lonely, so. Yeah, it's been a little bit. And I think who's, who's been using it? I think half the time we all, all see, too, if, like, JP's been using prime pieces and putting, like, 8,000 <laughs> plates on, like, what's JP doing? Yeah. And uh, so maybe we'll do that just so we can feel bad when we compare the videos from a strength standpoint. All right, guys, so quick little tip to make sure you're taking full advantage of any type of conversion press. So we did this on a prime but hammer strength, a lot of different machines, not even just plate loaded, even machines obviously converge. Um, and a lot of people when they're pressing just purely think up. And obviously if you're using a dumbbell or a barbell, it does kind of make sense that the most motion that's occurring is kind of this up motion. You know, you're not ever really finishing full adduction there, but with a converging press, you actually have the opportunity to continue to adduct and bring your upper arm across your body and actually load that pec in its fully shortened position. So. When you're pressing, again, it's kind of good all the time, but especially as you're finishing, think much more across. So as you're coming to the top, don't chop it off and end right there like you would with like a dumbbell press. Pull it all the way together. Think about jamming that bicep into the side of your pec or almost like you're trying to make your biceps touch and you get a much stronger contraction and actually continue to contract those pecs where they're still loaded. Aside from that, the only other thing I give that goes for all pressing for everyone is just you know, I say you don't have to record it, but probably should record it. Record your last sets um, and record the last few reps. Uh, and that's most likely where you're leaving some gains on the table. Look particularly on those last reps of the last sets, how you're starting and finishing reps. Most of the time, if you actually start a rep properly, you know, it's hard to kind of mess it up in the middle. But again, same thing on these. A lot of people will kind of get to the point where they're getting the full contraction and just kind of skip out on it. Um, and they might actually start actually doing that from the very beginning but as things get hard, things get painful, things start to change. So before you look at more complicated stuff, looking at your programming and this and that, should I switch exercises or whatever it is, sometimes it's obvious stuff. You know, you might have some perfect form on your warm-up sets, even the first few reps sometimes of your working sets, but lots of times, for me anyway, the obvious lack of stimulus is coming from things changing dramatically by the time you get to your working sets, changing range of motion, bouncing, using momentum, not using your muscles. Um, so one, that first tip, enjoy, make sure you're using that to get the most out of any type of converging press. Again, converging where the handles just come together. And then also, if you're just kind of wondering what else do I need to do to progress or if I'm leaving something on the table, look at the last reps of your last working sets. And most of the time, that's one of the most obvious places um, to fix something first before you look at more complicated stuff.
Do you want to rotate the fly at all? I mean, I kind of feel like almost any fly we rotate to doesn't feel quite as good. I like the, I mean, yeah, let's, if we could do the peck deck, that'd be that'd Okay, be nice. switch yeah. peck deck on that one. All right, so we'll, uh, let me write that prime peck deck. Um, did you want to keep the same, the high incline? You want yeah. maybe a different high incline? I like that one, yeah. Okay, That's really that. nice on my, on my joints and stuff. Uh, you know, we'll keep that one the same. And then from there, we'll go triceps. Um, and we can keep that. I mean, I like the way that the cable cross obviously lines up because yeah. it feels great. But I'm honestly just wanting something maybe with a little bit more output. Okay. Um, so maybe you want to just try the seated one there instead and just see okay. how that goes. Yeah. And then from there, we can just do cuff laterals, or we can always do a different delt variation. Maybe put that standing one in that we did at uh, Columbus. Try that one for a little bit. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that was great. Okay. Yeah. Standing lateral. And then um, we'll just keep dips out for now. And honestly, that'll leave us a little bit if we ever want to do something kind of once we get through this, a little bit, a little bit more pump stuff. We can do something right after that. And then um, I figured just keeping um, leg raises and calves just for the frequency on those as well, too. Mm -hmm. And then keep everything else there pretty much exactly the same. And that's push day. Yeah. Sweet. So that's what we're hitting today, guys. That's how it works. That's the very scientific thing. We'll get out later the uh, our calculators and some stuff and really do the secrets, which we won't share online. Um, but aside from that, you guys will see, we'll talk through the workout as we go through, but probably just start with, again, our typical, I don't think Terrence has taken much of a break. I took a little bit more of a break this last week, only trained once or twice. Been going. Yeah, he's been going. So we'll probably just pick up volume basically right where it's been at. Um, and if there's something I'm going to probably push as we go through the next couple of weeks where we're still trying to put on some good kind of rebound size is maybe just go sometimes instead of one or two, maybe three, like a third back offset here and there. That's what I've been doing. Yeah. yeah. And then um, aside from that, maybe we'll do like a little bit of pump work sometimes to finish. I like a little bit of extra volume for smaller stuff like today. Obviously, maybe a little bit more for triceps. Um, and then we'll cover the other days as we go through, guys. The only other things I wanted to actually add in that will be slightly different is a little bit more direct forearm work, um, which I'll probably just include a little bit on... Um, uh, arm day, a little bit on pool day as well too. And I actually might maybe do one like wrist extension today. Actually, it's an easy way to keep it. It might do wrist extensions one day, wrist curls another day, and then put them together again on arm day as well too. Okay. Just to have a little bit more frequency for there. So it's, we're getting to the point where, you know, we just put some little bit of meat on Terrence anywhere here and there. Um, yeah. A little bit more forearm size can't hurt as well too. Yeah, um, 10 pounds, so. Yeah, yeah, we got, some, we got some meat to put on, so it's gonna be fun. Um, yeah, man, so that's that. And uh, now let's get after it. Hope you guys enjoy the workout. Right, guys a little tip for the pec deck reality is this could work for pretty much any exercise um, but particularly for an exercise that you basically 
cover a large range of motion, especially if we were looking where you got the implement in your hand. So if we actually looked at the distance your hand is moving, it covers a pretty large distance. Um, and so what can happen, I think, sometimes is people basically just don't stay focused the whole time um, and really kind of lose track of even the most common sense thing, like what are we doing here? Well, you're using your pecs. And hopefully the whole time you're doing this, you're using your pecs to move everything. And I know that sounds like common sense, but again, people kind of get lost at some point in time. They either launch stuff or they don't finish stuff the right way or whatever it is. So when I'm warming up, a very good drill that I think you can use, and again, you can use this for any exercise, so by far not exclusive just to this, but it's just to basically stop at any point in time in the range of motion. So lots of times when I'm doing warm-ups, you might see that I'll stop here, bring it back, I'll stop here. But basically at any point in time, if you actually broke it down to doing essentially a little isometric, it's basically kind of a checking, am I actually using my pecs? Am I using my pecs through the entire range of motion? And that is a great check because again, if I, a lot of people will realize they might never actually use their pecs to finish. If the only thing you ever do is just launch from the bottom and get it moving to finish to the top. If I said, okay, now make sure you stop at the top, you're basically trying to like catch something there and you might not be capable of doing it. Um, so again, that's a great time to um, basically practice the movement. I always tell people that, I've said it a whole bunch of times, your warm up set should be practice, right? And the point of practicing as well too is you can think then, you can be technical then, you can actually have a lot of stuff running through your mind. That way when you get to the actual working sets, you really shouldn't think as much. There's always gonna be basically this little trade off that you know the more you're thinking, probably the less hard you can actually work. And the harder you're working, the more painful something is, technically the less you should be able to think. And I always kind of compare it to like, you know, practice versus game day. And I don't know shit about football, so spare me. But if we're talking about like Tom Brady, because everyone knows who Tom Brady is, I'm sure when he's actually throwing a pass, there's not a whole lot of technical stuff going through his mind. It's basically just the muscle memory connection, that whole deal at that point in time, and he just goes and does it. But if we looked at all the technical stuff that he's probably done since he first picked up a football, there's probably broken down a million times, like working on different things, working on what his feet are doing, his arms are doing, whatever. Again, football people know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Um, but again, there should be those things, in my opinion, exist in other sports. There's a time to be very, very technical, break down components, actually think, am I doing the things I'm supposed to be doing properly? And then there's the time when they actually work, when they actually go on the field and they perform, and they're not thinking. And that should be something I think we could use a little bit more in the bodybuilding world, is that nobody practices. Nobody ever takes time to think. And again, I'm not saying you have to come and do an entire workout, not actually doing working sets, just going through the motions. But you got warm-up sets, why not actually spend time thinking there? Do some stuff working more on tempo, doing drills where you're pausing. Am I actually using my muscles? And that way, yes, when you get into your working sets, you can just get in and work. And hopefully, you've practiced and rehearsed well enough that the form is just there. Because again, the flip side of that is, I joke that there's people that during their working sets, I can literally see that they're thinking really hard, they get their protractors out, and oh, something felt slightly off, and they stopped 12 reps short of failure that's obviously not good as well too. You need to balance that. How much am I thinking form thinking and how hard am I working? And again, I think the using your warm up sets is a great way to find that balance and still get stuff done in the gym. So just a little drill that you guys can do. Works great again on something where you cover a large range of motion, but really any exercise just to kind of check, am I actually using my muscles, which is the point of this whole deal in the first place.
All right, guys, just a little, uh, whenever I do anything that looks perceivably strange, I always feel like people are like, oh, why are you doing that? Why don't you do this? Or somehow this is complicated. Um, and all I really hopefully want to try and briefly accomplish with this video is that I just look at things differently than I feel like other people look at things. Um, and that makes me not emotional about basically finding any solution for anything. Um, and so really the, the whole point of doing this cable cross type of thing is um, it's basically just to make a skull crusher line up better. Um, so skull crushers honestly are great, great exercises. So if I kind of have three main categories I look at when I'm trying to decide is this a good exercise or is this not a good exercise or even not good or bad, just kind of where does it fit on that spectrum? And again, where does it fit with an individual? And so if I look at a bracing standpoint, the fact that I have a back pad here, the only reason I'm doing this as opposed to standing is because I want the same benefits you get with a skull crusher. So again, a skull crusher is great because you're lying down. So the fact that it's one less thing to move, you know, so I don't have to worry about my lower body, my torso, whatever, where if I do these cable crosses standing, either way when I'm standing, I'm limiting my output a little bit just because I don't have something unmoving to push into in direct opposition of the load. So skull crushers already have the bracing part perfect. So to reproduce that, that's why I'm doing these seated so I get just as good a bracing. The profile of skull crushers is also awesome. So basically at the bottom, you know, when I look at if I was holding a, you know, either doing skull crushers with a dumbbell or an easy bar or whatever it is, it's basically the heaviest when the line of force from that weight is gonna be at a 90 degree angle to my forearm, right? So where that line of force is the furthest from my elbow joint, that's where it's the heaviest, which happens to be where your triceps are around the strongest. So somewhere the length and mid range, if I look at the cable, so basically the cable is the same. You can actually see the line of force as opposed to just, you have to imagine it with a barbell or a dumbbell. Um, the setup with this, I'm trying to reproduce the same thing where it's heaviest some here in the mid range, length and range. And as you come to the top, imagine again, if I had a, uh, an easy bar or a dumbbell or whatever it is, as soon as I get all the way to the top, if I have my arm perfectly perpendicular to the ground, the load goes to zero. If I have my arm back just a little bit, there's still a little bit of torque there, a little bit of tension on the triceps, but it gets way lighter. And that's the pattern that you want. Skull crushers just happen to have that great loading pattern where heaviest, lightest, matching where your triceps are strongest and get weaker. So I set the cable height basically just to reproduce the exact same thing that skull crushers already have awesome. So you might be asking like, all right, well, if the skull crushers already have a bench, if they already have a good loading pattern, why would I change it? Well, it should kind of make sense. Like if I could get jammed in here, this should not look very comfortable and natural. And if I can keep my upper arm completely perpendicular to the ground the whole time, then it's gonna line up pretty well with my joints. But like most people, this is kind of how I comfortably sit. So I just want that line of force lined up perfectly through the elbow joint and the upper arm. So basically all I'm doing is by taking a cable, just happens to cross to line up this way, I can go in a much more comfortable arm position and I can have that cable line up straight through the upper arm and right through the elbow. And so basically, if you didn't see the fact that I have cables cross and we were looking just at lines of forces and loading patterns, and we looked just at one arm, basically what's happening with a skull crusher with an easy bar or a dumbbell or whatever is pretty much the exact same thing that happens here. Um, and then the only other little changes that I make is for most people, if they ever actually tried a neutral grip, like a neutral grip with a skull crusher uh, would actually feel much more comfortable for most people than fully pronated. So again, the only reason I use the handles here is basically so I can have a strong neutral grip uh, the whole time. So again, obviously you could do this with handles, but again, that hand position just isn't as comfortable as it is right here in that kind of neutral position. So it looks kind of like, oh, why is he doing all this crap and all this stuff put together? But everything's just one little piece. Or again, if you have those principles that are kind of overarching principles that don't change with my feelings, that don't change with whether I'm using a free weight or a cable, then it should be pretty kind of common sense where it's like, okay, well, I don't have any feels towards this exercise. I'm just gonna put my principles over top, see how well does it fit. And again, for an individual, so the same for Terrence, is he fits way better in this type of position than me trying to jam him in and make him do a bar. If you're at home watching this and you can line things up nice just like this, then skull crushers are a great movement for you. I wouldn't mess with this whole mess of shit either. Um, but if you're a little bit more like us, this is basically the cable version of skull crushers that won't eat your elbow joints over time and will feel much, much more comfortable. And again, if you haven't been where I've been, I've been training for over 20 years now. Um, I did skull crushers religiously for probably 15 years, logbook and doing all this stuff. How much weight can I put on? Really good form, good control. And over time, my elbows started to go to shit until I was like, holy crap, my elbows feel like shit. Um, and now having done these for a long period of time, elbows feel great. Um, so again, that's kind of the big thing on that one is uh, just alignment's the big difference between those two and hopefully giving you something a little bit different to think about. 
not when you just look at these two exercises, but when you look at pretty much any exercise. guys so uh, just a lateral raise variation I haven't done in a while um, I did these a couple years back honestly more with the goal of biasing more kind of front delt so you know going from this position to a bit more externally rotated is going to put more of the front delt on top of the joint obviously if you're looking at the axis that you're moving through more front delt on top so it really just shifts what you're biasing um, with this position definitely going to be more side delt but if you again look at where that axis is there's still a good bit of front delt on top of it. A little bit of rear delt can do a little bit of work as well too. But if we look at that line of force where it's passing through the joint, wherever it kind of bisects, which in this case is that side delt that's gonna do the most work. Um, so lines up really, really well. So it's one of those ones where again, you can obviously see the cable lies right with the upper arm. And I like this one too, because with the cable height, you can actually adjust to the point where we come a little bit further than I would on a typical lying lateral raise. Um, so even shorten that delta a little bit more and I can get that cable to the point where it's almost up against my arm. So obviously it'll never pass directly through the axis of the joint without being inside my body, but it'll get really light at the top, which again is the profile that I like for all of my raise variations, heavier at the bottom mid range ish and dropping off as it comes to the top. And so this is nice as well too. You can adjust the cable height here where if I put the cable a little bit higher, I'd make it heavier right out of the bottom and then just basically drop off and get lighter, again, lighter meaning torque at the, the shoulder joint, you know, as I go through the range of motion. How this setup is, is it's heavy-ish at the bottom, probably the heaviest somewhere right around here, and then again, drops off as I come through the top. The only downside of this one is I would like it with some more bracing. Um, so again, we tried actually messing around with it, doing it seated, but again, just for semantic reasons, the bench kind of gets in the way. And then also as well too, because you're seated so low and the cables can't go any lower, it was basically extremely heavy at the bottom, which is fine, but dropped off to near zero right here. So we're actually missing a bit more range of motion we could have contracted through. Um, so that's the only downside I was joking about. Um, Cybex used to make probably the best functional trainer, this like dual cable system, because they had an arm that would come down. And it's literally the best design functional trainer probably designed 20 years ago when people actually cared about smart stuff when designing equipment. And to this day, I don't know, maybe I was just thinking about maybe Cybex still has a patent on that. Maybe that's why no one else has done it. Um, but I wish Cybex would start making it again. Cybex, get on that, send me one. Um, because that would be the only thing that would make this better is if you could literally, so when I say an arm, it has a metal arm down with like a back pad on it that you can adjust the height, you can adjust this way. So pretty much any exercise you would do standing, you can set that pad up so it's pushing in direct opposition of the cables. So for this one, I could literally have it down a little bit lower. So I'm actually pressing down, like not just back, but down into a pad. So I could lean against that, which one, just having something to touch would actually help me keep my body still. I could feel myself doing this, which I tend to do if I'm not paying attention. And then also I could literally press into it in opposition of the cables. Um, because the funny thing is you wouldn't realize how much of a difference it makes, but I guarantee as soon as you push into something, you don't have all this stuff to stabilize and something to push into, we'd probably be able to do 25% more weight. But that being said, um, it's still a very good, basically, side raise variation. 
um, and definitely kind of one of three. I'll probably keep in rotation a little bit more with the line cuff laterals, these ones, and then the wire raises. Um, basically, honestly, all of those kind of bias the side delt the most, but work all the other heads to a degree. And that's the cool part about shoulders is you can change the axis so much. So again, where I typically like to do my lateral raises, you know, on a bench where they're coming from here to here, this one's almost kind of the opposite of that, but going from a little bit more externally rotated like this to a little bit more internally rotated like this and changing the axis, it still kind of biases the same muscles. And I do think in general, changing patterns, even if stuff does fit well, is still a pretty decent habit to do every couple months. Um, so again, just for the reason that I have three really good exercises that I kind of like all equally for different reasons that can all develop delts great, I'll kind of rotate between those three. So we're gonna put this one in, run it for a little while. Same thing if you're using the cuffs. Again, all our things being the same, anytime you can move that contact point, closer to the shoulder is a little bit less sheer, a little bit easier on the shoulder joint, but also does take the grip out of the equation a little bit. Again, if anyone's ever done these with handles, it's surprising how challenging it is because again, with a dumbbell, there's not really any grip pulling this way. It's harder to hold the dumbbell when it's pulling this way as opposed to when it's pulling straight down into your grip. And so basically if you're holding handles, it's kind of pulling almost the same direction the whole time. So it's pretty grip intensive and I like to do like long sets, drop sets on this as well too. So the cuff also takes the grip out of it. Just be aware if you're ever doing this, make a nice tight fist as you're going through, which most people kind of happens naturally, you don't think about it too much, or even hold on to something. Some people like to hold on to fat grips, lacrosse ball, something as well too, something that keeps the grip tight. But nice raise variation here. Give it a shot sometime, see if you like it. All right, guys, so in case it's not apparent from the video, seated half raise hat. I'm sure someone has done this at some point in time before, um, but with our new rotation now, um, we're training calves, I believe, twice over the course of the week. And I've said before, uh, which I, I still hold pretty accurate, is I always like to put the most of the time and effort in programming in this stuff with a straighter leg, just because it has more gastroc demands and arguably just as much soleus demands. Um, so that's going to stay prioritized on another day where we actually start a day with calves doing something with a more extended knee. Um, and I've said in the past, completely made up, but I like maybe maybe 25% of the time doing stuff with bent knee. Um, because again, you, the whole point of the bent knee is because the gas rock crosses over the knee and you flex it, you're going to shorten it and mechanically disadvantage the gas rock relative to the soleus, which arguably if something's working less, then yeah, in some way, shape or form, something else is working more. Um, so I want to start doing some seated calves. Um, we don't have a seated calf in this gym. In the past I've done, I definitely didn't make that up. I've, I've seen some other people do that before, but the hack of doing it on a leg curl, so actually putting your knees under the roller of a leg curl, and then putting your feet up on something. If you have a calf raise block like this one, great. Or you could always do plates or a box or something obviously that can just handle the load, not fall over and move. Um, but this ended up being a nice hack as well too. The main reason I did this one today as opposed to leg curls is because I saw this sitting over here and I remembered we have this thing. So this is obviously for people that have delicate upper traps uh, that don't want a metal bar on their back. They can use this to preserve their delicate upper traps and squat with it. Also, um, when I see females that will, or males, not just females, but mostly females, or males doing thrusters or bridges or whatever the hell you wanna call them, a lot of people will put this over the bar as well too, because that makes more sense not wanting a metal bar digging into your pelvis um, and digging into bone when you're thrusting 500 pounds and also on the Smith machine as well too. So this is one of these, either the delicate trap protector or the pelvis protector when you're doing thrusts also works out really well, seems for seated calf raises. So aside from that, everything's pretty straightforward, something to sit on that won't break, something to get more range of motion. So again, you could obviously do these on the floor, but you're not gonna get things as, stre as uh, um, stretched. And then obviously, I guess if you were really hardcore, I'm making fun of people with delicate traps you know, putting this on their upper back for squatting, but I guess I have delicate quads because I'm putting this on here and I don't want this digging into my quad. Um, so my quads are delicate. And I'm gonna preserve them with this pad. But everything else exactly the same as seated leg curls. So if you don't have a seated leg curl at your gym, 
and you have a Smith machine, here's a nice little hack. I'm sure someone has done this before, um, but either way, uh, one way or another, I'm gonna put my last name on it, and you have to ask permission before you use it, film it, reproduce it, and uh, make sure you give me credit 37 times per video when you do it, otherwise it doesn't count. All right, guys, uh, so that's the session. Um, you know, covered most of the exercises, a couple of them that I've done before a whole bunch of times, so I won't say a whole lot of extra stuff on, uh, but just to roll through it real quick, we have that prime converging chest press to start, um, then from there went to pec deck, then from there to a high incline press. That high incline press, I might get some questions on. The goal there is mainly front delt. We're definitely gonna pick up some upper pec fibers, clavicular pec fibers a little bit as well too. Um, and then from there, if we look at something slightly different from previously, I go right to triceps next. Um, and again, I selected that movement because again, I think it's one of the most efficient movements, really again, overloading the triceps where they're strongest, lines up very well. Um, and so that'll be a big one that we're like, same with all of them, but really looking to progress because if there's a body part, I still want to make more freaky on Terrence's triceps. Then from there, we have a new um, side delt raise variation. So again, that's kind of looking at what kind of part of the delts we're covering with this workout. Um, we're hitting basically front delt with the overhead press, all the pressing, your front delts involved as well too. And then doing something to bias a little bit more side delts with that raise. Um, and then after that, finishing with a superset of calves and abs, just to try and keep them consistent. And again, I've said before, in another day of the split, we actually start with calves and abs, one to really prioritize them, um, but two, most apart, because it's a smaller uh, muscle group, body part, and it's not really gonna take away from what comes after it. As far as volume goes here, basically two working sets on everything. Might have done three on the calves, just trying to kind of figure out the weight today. Um, and not a whole lot will change from there. So moving forward um, from here, I'll probably will, as long as Terrence is recovery good, maybe add a little bit of volume every single workout. Um, and so again, places like actually for the triceps, we already did three working sets. So for things I want to prioritize, I'm already allocating a little bit more volume towards them. Um, but for things we're trying to bring up, I might just taper up the volume just a little bit. Obviously, as adding working volume is a form of progressive overload as well too. But really just trying to mess around with, I most importantly, want his uh, basically PR sets. So his logbook track sets for given exercises to basically the goal is to hit PRs. The goal is to get obviously within his standardized really good form and still obviously working on improving form always, you know, to really be at a PR level strength because that will correlate with a PR level size coming to stage. Um, but that being said, when the recovery is very good, I will taper up volume just a little bit as well too because obviously progressing volume can also lead to more muscle as well too. But obviously that hits a point of diminishing returns. So I basically only taper that up when his recovery is best. Um, aside from that, I think everything's pretty straightforward. And, um, you know, we'll just basically keep the workouts coming, you know, as things change or adjust, or if I want to break out stuff more, you know, moving into this off season. And again, just for context here, this is going to be really the first off season that Terrence has had in a long time, still not technically a full off season, um, but he's going to have a few months at least to grow before he's got to start, uh, tapering back down and obviously dieting back down for the Olympia, but that's the goal. Olympia is next. The goal is to bring something, uh, definitively the best to stage for Terrence. Um, his balance is probably about the best it's ever been now. So really just about making everything bigger, completely maxing out that weight cap and uh, hopefully just uh, freaking some people out come Olympia stage time. And uh, the goal is obviously to take home the title. So hope you guys enjoy the workout. Do the YouTube thing if you haven't already. Like, subscribe, share with some friends and I'll see you guys on the next one.